democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our conversation with Dr. Robert J. Lifton, leading American psychiatrist, author of more than 20 books, on Thursday, Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I spoke with him about his new book, The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mind, Hope and Survival, in the midst of the massive hurricanes and the wildfires in California. I asked him about climate change, what he's called the apocalyptic twin of nuclear war. Climate change, yes, is the apocalyptic twin. And we saw in those images of the hurricanes just in the last couple of months, and still, uh, a kind of apocalyptic damage, the destruction of cities, of islands, uh, of most of Puerto Rico, a large area, uh, and doubts about the capacity to uh, recover and to uh, really uh, prevent the most long-standing damage to these places, there has to be a kind of prospective survivor, somebody who imagines this happening. But now we have visual evidence in these hurricanes, not caused by climate change, but rendered much more extreme, according to much scientific evidence. Uh, we have evidence which the rest of us can take in as prospective survivors of further climate damage that threatens our whole civilization. I call them apocalyptic twins because only these two threats, these two developments, can destroy the human species. I no longer speak so much of climate change denial but rather climate change rejection. Uh, it's impossible not to, in at least one part of one's mind, recognize that there is something called global warming and that it's very dangerous to it, to us, and that we're contributing to it. Uh, it doesn't mean that one accepts it. One recognizes it partially. The human mind can be very contradictory. One can both recognize it and reject it. Reject it because it's contrary to one's anti-government stance. You need governments to cooperate to do anything about it. And because it's antithetical to one's identity and to one's worldview, uh, and also to one's financial sponsors, all that uh, feeding climate rejection. But even as they try to make adaptation, how are you going to restore these coastal areas? Um, the issue of climate change arises more readily. So, although we are not satisfied with the amount of emphasis on global warming, it's making its way uh, into what I call uh, species awareness or a climate swerve. One wishes it would happen faster, but it is happening. But it's interesting that you that you say that this climate swerve or change in climate mindset is happening at the same moment that the Trump administration is perhaps the most vocal in uh, renouncing uh, uh, climate science or in climate rejection, as you call it. I want to go back to President Trump uh, uh, last month uh, when he traveled to Mandan, North Dakota, and celebrated his decision to pull out of the landmark 2015 climate deal while speaking outside an oil. Refinery. In order to protect American industry and workers, we withdrew the United States from the job-killing Paris Climate Accord. Job-killer. People have no idea. Many people have no idea how bad that was. And right here in North Dakota, the Dakota Access Pipeline is finally open for business. I also did Keystone. You know about Keystone. Another one. Big one. Big. First couple of days in office, those two. 48,000 jobs. Tremendous, tremendous thing. I think environmentally better. I really believe that. Environmentally better. So that was President Trump speaking on September 6th in Mandan, North Dakota. It was just about a year after the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleashed dogs on protesters, Native American protesters, water protectors who were trying to protect the planet and not have that DAPL uh, pipeline built. It was 
after, just after Hurricane Harvey had inundated the greater Houston area, and Hurricane Irma was just making landfall. He chose this moment to come to this controversial spot, where hundreds of Native Americans just down the road from the oil refinery had been jailed for their fight for water protection, to announce once again, look at what I've done, pull out of the Paris Accord and greenlight these pipelines. But that story isn't over, and the story continues. It has proven very difficult for Trump to pull out of the Paris Accord. As soon as it was announced, there was a heartening response on the part of governors and mayors all over the country, saying that their states or their cities would follow the Paris Accord. And there was an even more intense international response, a joint statement by Germany, France and Italy, that the Paris Accord was irreversible, and by China, that they would continue their uh, uh, involvement in the Paris Accord. And then the Trump administration issued a series of so-called clarifications. Well, we'll go to the meetings. Well, we don't exactly have to pull out. We'll renegotiate. In other words, obfuscating the whole issue, which is very Trumpian and uh, not so surprising. The reason why it's difficult for him to pull out of the Paris Accord is that there's a worldwide consensus about it that's more powerful than any person, even the most dangerous person in the world, Donald Trump. And in that sense, again, we like more. Uh, it's outrageous that Trump would try to pull out of uh, a world-saving accord, or at least uh, something in the direction of that. Uh, it should really be criminal for a, for a president to do that. But at least we can say that the climate swerve or the species awareness, the idea that we're all in a, members of a single species in deep trouble, as I put it, uh, all that prevents him from pulling out absolutely and leaves the whole matter unclear. Is it your sense that there are sufficient restraints on uh, uh, Donald Trump acting unilaterally on either of these fronts, of course there climate are not. or nuclear? Uh, uh, you'd have to have total restraints for them to be sufficient with a man like Donald Trump. Of course there aren't sufficient restraints. And whoever depended upon generals to restrain a civilian uh, in so many different areas. Uh, and we don't know the outcome. I'm not, in my book uh, or in my work, promising that we've accomplished enough to prevent climate damage and uh, real disaster from happening. It's happening already. Uh, what I'm saying is that there has been a shift in mindset that makes possible the actions, the sensible actions necessary to curb global warming. Uh, we still haven't taken those actions fully. And, you know, at the beginning of my book, I, I speak of the ultimate absurdity, the ultimate absurdity that if we do nothing but what we're doing now, and it's what I mean by malignant normality, just go on using fossil fuels. Um, we will do ourselves in as a civilization pretty much by the end of this century. Nothing could be more absurd than that. But at least we have a beginning shift in mindset that allows us to take reasonable action. And that's what Paris was all about. I wanted to ask you about the quote you begin your book with. Uh, you quote the American poet uh, Theodore Retke, saying, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. Yes, that's a beautiful line from a very great poet. Um, I've used that throughout my career, because uh, it's, in a way, what my work is about. Uh, I've studied uh, a lot of descents into darkness, um, Hiroshima, the Vietnam War, Nazi doctors and others, Om Shinrikyo in Japan. Uh, and I always feel there's something to be learned from what happened. And it doesn't mean that we're guaranteed to make good use of our history and never do it again. It does mean that some kind of knowledge can come from it. And I see myself in that, in that way as what I call a witnessing professional, trying to use my 
professional knowledge to bear witness to and in some way reveal more about uh, this kind of darkness. Can you talk more about the Nazi doctors? I mean, you devote a chapter um, uh, to them here, but I mean, your work spans nine. Well, you are 91 years old now. Yes. You have so much wisdom and uh, both experience and all you have brought to this. Tell us what we should learn from what you learned from these men. With the Nazi doctors, when a German doctor, uh, who would be a member of the Nazi party, was assigned to Auschwitz, he was expected to do so-called selections and send most arriving Jews to the gas chamber. That was considered normal behavior for a doctor in Auschwitz. Some of them had difficulty with it, but ultimately they adapted to it. Um, this is rendering professionals a hired gun for uh, a malignant version of normality. And I learned that, in extreme ways, professionals can be put to use for killing rather than healing. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. But we also saw expressions of that, not quite as fully uh, expressed, but with American psychologists and, for a while, psychiatrists engaging in torture, uh, and that being an expected norm, normal behavior. You're talking about for, the American Psychological Association yeah, cooperating about, with President Bush. That's right. And I'm talking about um, both individual psychologists and psychiatrists, and then the American Psychological Association uh, collaborating with the torturers. I, I call that a scandal within a scandal. It's a scandal that professionals are doing that, but it really shows that we have to, as professionals or as anything, recognize what our work is being used for and where uh, it's being put uh, in connection with despotic uh, behavior. The scandal within a scandal is uh, uh, an association that's supposed to watch over the ethics of a profession, joins in torture, or at least protects those who join in torture. But all that was exposed by a movement from within psychologists, from within the American Psychological Association, with the help of uh, reasonably good leadership on the part of the American Psychiatric Association, who said it was wrong for any psychiatrist to be in the room during an interrogation that could spill over into torture. Yes, that those were examples of malignant normality, not in Nazi Germany, but in uh, relation to a democratic uh, United States of America. And with Trump, of course, uh, malignant normality becomes the rule because he's president, and what a president does tends to normalize uh, potentially bad, evil, or destructive behavior. Dr. Robert J. Lifton, leading American psychiatrist, his latest book, The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mind, Hope and Survival. That does it for our show. We want to wish Robbie Karen a very happy 10th anniversary with Democracy Now! And our speaking schedule this weekend, Juan Gonzalez speaks at noon today at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I'll be speaking tonight at 8 p.m. in Albany at the SUNY Albany Symposium on Telling the Truth in a Post-Truth World, along with Bob Schieffer, historian Douglas Brinkley, and New York Times reporter Glenn Thrush. Then on Saturday, Juan Gonzalez will speak at that same Albany Symposium at 11.30. Check our website for details. That does it for the show, Democracy Now! Produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Denita Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Goddess, Dina Sam Alcoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masood, Tarina Nadura. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.